ultimate Thai beef salad. This one comes straight from my mum's recipe book. This is a childhood favorite of mine. I can't wait to show you guys how to make it. So there are a couple of really key things that we need to get right to get this Thai beef salad like perfection. So uh, first of all, we're gonna start off with the marinade and the dressing. So I'm using some palm sugar here. Now this is a really firm palm sugar, it's generally the type of palm sugar that you get outside of Thailand and it just requires a little bit of shaving. So shaving the palm sugar like this helps it to dissolve more easily in the marinade and the dressing. Okay, so I just want a little bit of that sugar for my marinade and the rest I'm gonna set aside for later for the dressing. Now I want some fish sauce as well. Now this marinade is where I go a little bit rogue from my family recipe. My mum would just straight out grill the steak. I like to add this little extra step. So I'm gonna add a little bit of black pepper as well. I'm using ribeye steak or also called scotch fillet steak today, but you could use any kind of cut of steak that you prefer. Now the steak goes in there and guys, this is an intense marinade. That fish sauce is strong and pungent and I don't need that sugar to work its magic for very long. So it only needs a couple of minutes. So while that beef is marinating, I'll do my dressing. Now dressing is very simple. We take the palm sugar that we shaved off earlier. Now, if palm sugar is not something you can find locally, you could use a light brown sugar or even just some regular white sugar would be fine. Okay, we want, again, some fish sauce and then some lime juice. And I'm just sort of squishing down on it a little just to release all those juices inside. Okay, so just mix that through and just squish the palm sugar with the back of your spoon just to help it keep dissolving as it sits here on the bench top as well. Now, time to get the steaks cooking. So I'm just heating up my pan and add a little bit of oil. And now time for that magic moment where meat meets pan. Mm, I love that sizzle. So I'm gonna leave this first side on quite a high heat so we can get some really good color going. Okay, now that's looking really good. And see how just that little bit of sugar has really helped us get that beautiful caramelization on the outside of that steak. Now it's time for part two, which is where we try to cook the meat through evenly through the center. So I'm gonna turn the heat down. And what I'm looking for is the kind of pressure you would feel when you push down on that part of your palm. And I'm just gonna keep turning and flipping every so often until I can feel that meat. Now that's gonna be a nice medium rare. So I'll take that off and I wanna let that rest for a good five to 10 minutes. In the meantime, we can get our salad ingredients ready. Okay, so first up, we just want a small onion. So we we'll cut that into thin wedges and we want a tomato. So when I was little, my mum used to use cherry tomatoes as well. So you could totally use those and some cucumber. Now I like to take the seeds out for this one because I find that the seeds tend to make the salad a little watery. So just, I like to chop my cucumber into irregular little pieces. And now for the herbs. So this is one of the things that I just love about Thai salads. The herbs are not some little garnish that goes on top. The herbs form part of the salad. They're like another vegetable. So don't be shy with the herbs. And I've got some coriander that I'm using and I love to use the stems as well. So I'm chopping those up along with the leaves. And I want some spring onion as well. And now the major herb flavor for this salad is mint. So I'm gonna pick off some nice leaves of those. And then some chilies. So I'm using this large red chili, which really has more of a capsicum flavor. And now our beef has had ample time to relax. And I wanna slice this as fine, as thin as you can get it because the lime juice and the dressing will continue cooking and soaking into the meat as well. Okay, so we just add our beef into the rest of our ingredients. It just gives that dressing one final stir. You can see that that palm sugar is dissolved nicely in there. And then start spooning that over. Now, I like to go with about half of the dressing first and then just give this a bit of a mix and see where we're at. And now for the part where things get really pretty in that bowl. Okay, and now it's time to eat. Look at that, look at all those colors. Beautiful steak. And traditionally you would serve this with some rice on the side, but that's totally up to you guys. So 
this one is a restaurant classic, but boy, do I have an epic recipe for you guys to make at home. Sweet, tangy, glossy sauce, beautiful, toasty cashews. This is my Thai cashew chicken. So cashew chicken is one of those dishes that's sort of like sweet and sour. There are so many different versions, so many different variations of how sweet, how sour, uh, all the different things. Well, this one is my version. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, mine is probably more on the slightly tangy, not so sweet side. And because I'm me, I'm gonna be adding in some chilies because you know, I'm me. <laughs> all right, let's do the chicken part first of all. And I'm using chicken breast here, which is odd. Usually I'm a thighs and legs girl, as you guys know. Uh, but I do know a lot of you like to use chicken breast and I do quite like it in this one. And always for me, directly season the meat. Seasoning flour to me is such a waste of time. <laughs> and so many recipes do call for seasoned flour. I just think if you want some seasoning, get it straight on whatever you want to season. Now I'm just gonna mix that through. And I want some corn flour on here. And for all my American friends, that's cornstarch to you. It's the same thing, just called a different name. And let's just mix that. Okay, now I want to make a really quick sauce here. Really simple ingredients. Um, just you want to get the right balance of like sweet and tangy here. So I want some soy sauce and some dark soy sauce. I've got dark sweet soy sauce, but it's mainly for color here. So just a regular Chinese dark soy sauce is fine as well. And some white vinegar and some sugar. Oh, I almost forgot a little dash of corn flour as well in here. It's going to help us thicken up and get our sauce all shiny and glossy. Okay, just give that a mix. And now we're ready for our chicken. So essentially we're going to be cooking the chicken twice. First of all is a bit of a shallow fry. I've got some oil in my wok here. It's going to have a look. And yeah, we've got some nice little bubbles here, so that tells me we're good to go. And just kind of dust any excess flour off that chicken and then into the oil. Now, I don't need this chicken to get really dark. I'm not doing a, a deep fried chicken here. I just want a kind of nice sealed coating on the outside of that chicken and that is going to soak up all the sauce and we come to do the stir frying later. Okay, so that's looking pretty much right. All right, I'm going to take that chicken out. And it is important when you're cooking chicken breast that you don't over fry it in this first step because that's when you get really dry chicken breast at the end. First cook on the chicken done. Now we're gonna bring everything together. So I wanna get my wok heating up. A bit of oil, and some garlic, some onion. And then I like to get my cashews in here straight up because I want them to kind of toast and get nice and golden in there. Okay, so see how we're getting that really nice color on those cashews? It's just what I'm looking for. So now I'm going to add in some dried chilies. These are optional, um, but I love that kind of deep, savory, almost smokiness that you get from dried chilies. And these ones aren't very hot, so they're not going to make it too spicy. It's going to add some flavor and color. And just chopping them straight in with some scissors. Now some capsicum. Oh, I love all the colors in this dish so bright and cheerful. Okay, now in goes my chicken. And our sauce. And now just keep stir frying this for a minute or so until that sauce thickens up, the sugar will dissolve, everything will magically turn shiny and glossy. And now for some greenery, I want some spring onion. Oh, see what I mean about the glossy? Beautiful.
Now to my liking, this isn't a super saucy stir fry. It's like a sticky kind of stir fry. So that looks perfect. And time to get it out on our plate. Wok chard, savory, chewy noodles. Patsy eel is all about the details, my friends. Here it is, guys. Patsy eel wunsen, or stir-fried soy sauce glass noodles. Patsy eel literally translates simply as stir-fry soy sauce. So the ingredients for this one are very simple, but it means that the devil is in the detail in order to make one that's really, really beautifully perfect. So stay with me, guys. Let's do the chicken part first, and I'm gonna add a little marinade here. So I've got some chicken thigh. I'm a staunch thigh girl when it comes to stir frying for Asian dishes. Chicken breast would be fine too. And some soy sauce. I want some sesame oil here. So sesame oil isn't always included in a pad eel, but I like to put it in here because it'll give you a little bit of like the smokiness that you would get from like a really high restaurant style pad eel, um, just in case you don't get your wok or your pan hot enough. And then a little bit of white pepper. To me, the white pepper and the soy sauce, the two most important things for this dish. Okay, let's give that a mix. That doesn't need long to marinate, just leave it there while we get the rest of our stuff organised. Next thing I'm going to do is prep the noodles. So these are the noodles I'm using and these are cellophane or glass noodles. They're also called bean vermicelli noodles, bean thread vermicelli noodles, mung bean noodles. Uh, there are a lot of names for them. But these are much easier to find than the fresh rice noodles that you would traditionally use for a Thai padsi eel. But these ones, give you the closest texture because they're chewy uh, and they're nice and soft. So I recommend these if you can't get the fresh rice noodles. Another thing with these noodles though is they cook in like the fastest time. Uh, I reckon they're the fastest cooking noodles that you can possibly get a hold of. So you need to do this carefully, otherwise you'll end up with like a soggy mess in your wok later on. So I've got some hot water here. It doesn't even have to be boiling, just some hot water and I'm gonna pour that on top and soak the noodles rather than boil them. A lot of you guys have trouble with these noodles, I know, because you've written in and told me about it, so here's the foolproof way to do it. Okay, now don't go and check your phone or start scrolling through Instagram or something. Um, these will cook in literally like two minutes, so I just like to use my tongs here and loosen them up as they're soaking. And now just when they're softened, lift them out and then just pop them on the side here, ready to stir fry. So the next thing we need to do is get our stir fry sauce ready. And again, as soy sauce is the main ingredient here, I have some soy sauce. This one is a regular Chinese light soy sauce. And then you also want a dark soy sauce to give you some color here. So I'm using a sweet dark soy sauce here. You can see it's nice and thick. And if you're in Indonesia or Australia, your most common sweet dark soy sauce will be ketchup manis. Now, some fish sauce here as well. A little dash of sugar too. Okay, just give that a mix. Now, one more thing, which is a non-negotiable for me whenever I'm eating padsi eel, and that is chili vinegar. If you're not putting this on the end of your padsi eel noodles, you are missing out. Uh, and it's really simple to do. So I just want some red chili, just some nice slices. and add that into just some regular white distilled vinegar. This is always the condiment you will find here in Thailand for pad si eel on the street or in a restaurant, so you really gotta make it for home as well. And now for the green vegetable part of our noodle dish, I'm using young Chinese broccoli. So that's also called gai lan, but these are younger stems. So you can see they're quite thin at the end here. Um, and I, I quite like the younger, sweeter uh, Chinese broccoli for this one. If you can only get the bigger Chinese broccoli, uh, that's fine as well. Just thin out the stems a little more. You can also use broccolini too. That's a good one to use. Now, in terms of slicing here, what you want to do is angle your knife so that you're slicing on the diagonal. And that way you are kind of thinning out those stems a little bit so that they'll cook quicker in the wok. 
did say the devil was in the detail when it comes to a really good padsy eel. And that comes down to chopping vegetables too. Okay, now the leaves just in big chunks. And now one last thing to get ready is our eggs. Okay, so time to get all the magic happening in the pan. I'm using a wok, you can use a large frying pan as well. Just want some oil in there and some garlic. And my chicken. And already that smell is so intoxicating with garlic and the soy sauce and the chicken. I just stir fry that until the chicken is just cooked. Now you want to add in your egg. Just kind of swirl your pan a bit and get that egg cooking on the hot surface. I like to let things get a little charry here. That to me is the other kind of flavor of padsy eel. You have the soy sauce, you have things a little bit charry, you have the pepper. That's what makes it really special. Okay, start to mix that through. Oh, got some good color there. And now my green vegetable. That only needs like half a minute because we've thinned out those stems so they cook really quickly. I want them to keep nice and crunchy. And now my noodles. So it'll kind of look like a noodle pancake at this point because that's just what happens when noodles cool down. But when we add our sauce and give everything a mix, you'll see it will magically transform. Okay, so you just kind of keep mixing here until every strand of noodle is beautifully coated and coloured. And you can see just how light and fluffy and not sticky those noodles are. And last, but certainly not least, a little sprinkling of some more white pepper. And there you have it, the simplest of stir fries, and yet get every detail right, and it really will be magical, guys, I promise. Right, let's serve this up. And now don't forget your chili vinegar. Fragrant, savory, spiced rice and chicken. This one is a Thai food classic and I'm gonna show you how to make my version at home. This is Khao Mok Gai. I love this one and it's very unique because it has a very different flavor profile to most Thai dishes. This one has lots of rich dried spice flavors and curry powder flavors. It's really awesome. All right, let's get going on the marinade paste first. So we start off with quite classical Thai ingredients. First of all, we want some garlic and some coriander root. And now some ginger. Just a little dash of salt here and you just want to pound this to a smooth paste. Okay, so this is the kind of situation that you're looking for here. I'm gonna get that straight out into a big bowl. And now come some of the ingredients that you don't usually find in Thai cooking. So this dish has its origins in the Muslim community here in Thailand. And so some of the ingredients are not as familiar to our Thai everyday cooking. I'm gonna add in some yogurt and some curry powder. And again, I think a lot of people think of Thailand, they think of curries, but we don't often use curry powder as an ingredient. We generally rely on fresh ingredients like lemongrass and galangal and chilies for our curry paste. There are some dishes with curry powder, obviously this is one of them. And I want some fish sauce and some turmeric. The turmeric here really is one of the defining flavors and colors of this dish, so it's really important. I'll just give that a mix. Now I'm gonna add in my chicken pieces here. And for me guys, it's gotta be 
dark meats for this one. It's got to be drumsticks and chicken thighs because they tend to remain juicier while they're cooking in your big pot. Now just give that a mix. Now, if you're really organized, it would be great if you could leave this to marinate overnight, but I generally tend to not be that organized or have that much time. So I'm gonna pretty much use mine straight away. Now the traditional thing to do here would be to deep fry that chicken. I'm gonna do it in a little bit more of a convenient way today. I'm just gonna shallow fry it in a little bit of oil. Now take your chicken pieces. Now the only way to do this really is with your hands. So you're gonna have to get a little dirty here. Just scoop off most of that marinade because I'm gonna use that marinade a bit later and get your chicken straight into the pan. Now the idea here is that we wanna get a really beautiful deep dark color on our chicken pieces. One, it just looks great. Two, it starts to develop a really beautiful flavor when we get that caramelization. You'll see it. Now remember, don't throw that marinade away. We need that for later. Okay, so a couple of minutes and let's turn these guys over. Oh, that's perfect. Look at that beautiful color. Mm. Now a couple more minutes on this second side. And now just transfer that chicken out of the pan. It doesn't need to be cooked through. It'll finish cooking a bit later on. Now would you take a look at that gloriousness happening in the bottom of that pan there. That is some good chicken fat and we are not going to waste it. So I just want a good few spoonfuls of that. And then I'll just get this pan cleaned up so we can continue on. Okay, so I've got my clean pan. I'll pour that chicken fat back into there. And now let's go in with some onion. And always when I'm sweating down onions like this, I add a little dash of salt. And you'll notice that throughout a lot of the dishes that I cook, there's some seasoning that happens every step of the way. We seasoned our paste at the beginning, we added fish sauce into the chicken, a little bit of salt here, and that really helps to develop the flavors in the finished dish. Now once these onions have had a few minutes to soften up in here, now these onions are soft, a little sweet now, I'm gonna add in some tomato. And I wanna give this tomato a little bit of time to kind of get all mushy make friends with that onion. Okay, so see how that tomato is a little bit pulpy? Now we want to add in the rice. This is a Thai jasmine rice. Any long grain rice will do. Now I'm going to sprinkle in some crispy fried shallots. Now that chicken marinade we saved earlier, that goes in here. This dish reminds me so much of an Indian biryani. In fact, a lot of people call this Thailand's version of biryani. And now some spices. You want a cinnamon stick, some green cardamom pods, and a couple of bay leaves. And some chicken stock. Already those beautiful spices are really making my kitchen smell delicious. Now we nestle those chicken pieces back into the pan, nice and snug in there. Now put the lid on, turn the heat down a smidge, I just want a gentle bubble on that liquid. So in the meantime, we're gonna make a little minty sauce to go on at the end. Now you would have heard me say this before, but it's often the condiments that make the dish here in Thailand. So don't skip this one. What you want is a big old lot of mint here and some coriander and a little spicy kick. I want a green chili here. This one's fairly fiery. And now some white vinegar, dash of sugar and a little pinch of salt. And blend that till it's really nice and smooth. Okay, so this is what you're after and Oh, that beautiful, fresh mint smell is so lovely. And that color, oh, so joyful. Mm. I love that so much. It is just like an instant brightener. That beautiful tangy vinegar infused with all those herbs and just that little touch of sweetness. 
Ooh, that little touch of spice. Perfect. Right, so the only part about this dish that sucks is waiting while the smell in your kitchen is so delicious. Oh, I wish you guys could smell this. Let's take a look. Beautiful, that rice has soaked up all of that flavor, that chicken is cooked through. Now, my little trick here is to just fish out the chicken and pile it up in a corner over here. And that gives us a little bit of space to fluff up our rice. Before I get to that though, I'm just gonna pull out some of these spices that I can see, the cardamom pods, bay leaves, cinnamon stick, and then using a fork, just get in there and fluff that rice. Now I start off by scooping the rice on the top and then have a look down the bottom there, you can see we've got some really dark, crusty bits of rice. That's my favorite bit. I just like to kind of scoop that up and mix it through. Any really dark bits, take those out and leave those on the side. I kind of sneak them and eat them myself. Now that's looking good. And we are ready to go, my friends. So pile up a nice bit of that gorgeous sunshine yellow rice. A couple of pieces of chicken. And the finishing touches. A little sprinkling of coriander, some more crispy fried shallots, and that epic green sauce we made earlier, and then a little dash of sweet chili sauce. And that, my friends, is one homemade chicken rice dish that is so comforting. Even just the smell of it cooking is ridiculously comforting for me. Let's have a look. I like to get the perfect mouthful always. A little bit of chicken, some rice. Don't forget those sauces. Spicy and Thai salads, they're like best friends and this one is one of my very favorites, one of my childhood favorites actually. You guys are gonna love this one. So when I was growing up, I would have had a lard style salad at least once a week, twice a week. My mom used to make it with pork, with duck, with all sorts of stuff. I'm gonna make a chicken version today. Uh, but first of all, we are going to make a chili powder because loads of you have been writing in and saying you can't find a chili powder that looks similar to mine. Um, so the one that I'm using here in Thailand, you can see like lots of little seeds in there, plus the chili powder as well. And we're gonna make this so that you guys can make it at home as well. So start off with the chilies. You've got the large dried red chilies here. In Thai, we call these pratifa. And then you've got the smaller ones. In Thailand, we call these ones Prikdinda, but overseas they're commonly called bird's eye chilies, so look out for those. So anyway, let's start with the large chilies. And I'm just gonna use some scissors to cut them into little small pieces. And then my smaller little spicy guys. Now you wanna get these into a dry frying pan and then just heat them and roast them until you'll know when it happens because you'll start to sneeze and you can really smell those chili fumes. Okay, so I'm starting to get some of those fumes in here. And uh, what that tells me is that we're getting to the point where we've released the aromas and the essential oils in those chilies, and that's just what we want. Oh, whew, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> now I'm gonna use a little coffee grinder to grind these up. Whew, it's dangerous business. Okay, so you can see that we've got a really beautiful powder here, as well as some seeds as well. And this is just a really good texture. I like the level of spice in this type of chili powder as well. Okay, now the other essential ingredient for any larp salad is the roasted rice powder. If you've ever tried to make larp at home and it hasn't tasted quite like the one you had at your really good Thai restaurant, it's because you've left this ingredient out. So what you need is some raw sticky rice. It's also called glutinous rice. Uh, you can use regular long grain, but I do find that uh, it's a little tougher to break down and can be a little bit too crunchy. So try to find the sticky rice and then you wanna get that straight into a dry frying pan as well. And then just keep these guys dancing around in the pan until they're a beautiful dark golden color. And you can kind of smell, it's almost like a popcorn kind of smell. It's very toasty and nutty. Okay, these are looking really beautiful. I'm gonna use my mortar and pestle now to grind them to a fine powder. So this is the kind of texture that you're looking for. 
Okay, so now let's get the rest of our stuff going that we need for this salad. I'm gonna get the dressing done first. And I've got some palm sugar here. Now this is what palm sugar will look like when you grab it from the store. It's kind of like a firm block. So you just need to shave the palm sugar. And shaving it with a knife means you're also softening it so it'll dissolve in the dressing. Now for this one, if you can't get palm sugar, you can just use normal white sugar. And to that I'm gonna add some fish sauce and some of that chili powder. Now be a little cautious here because we can always add more chili later. And then a little dusting of the rice powder as well. Just press down on my limes, just release all the juices inside. Now I'm just gonna squeeze a couple of tablespoons in here. I like to finish my seasoning at the end when I can taste everything together. So I'll leave some lime slices aside for that. So this is just classic Thai food magic happening here. The sweet, the sour, the salty, the spicy, all the good things. Now for the salad itself, I also want some little red Asian shallots here. You could also use red onion as well. Okay, so now let's talk about the herbs. I think this is another crucial part of this salad that you need to get right. So first of all, I'm gonna start off with some spring onion. And then here in Thailand, we have a type of coriander that's called in English, sawtooth coriander. So you can see why it's called sawtooth. Uh, it's got this kind of ridged edge. Now, if you can find this herb at an Asian grocer or a Thai grocer, please go ahead and try it. It has the most amazing sort of beautiful, almost medicinal, slightly bitter flavor. Um, but you can just leave it out if you can't find it, but look out for it, sawtooth coriander. And then I want some regular coriander as well. Now I know a lot of you are not huge fans of coriander and you're in luck because if not, you can leave it out for this salad because the most important herb, I think, is actually the mint. Okay, so now time to cook our chicken and the way we're gonna do this might be a little bit unconventional by Western standards, but uh, traditionally the meat for a lab salad is generally poached in some water, some liquid. So I'm gonna use chicken mince here. I'm gonna add some liquid into the pan, just a little bit of water. And I'm gonna add my chicken mince in here. And the whole idea here is that we don't wanna fry the meat. We don't want any browning, we just want the meat to cook through without coloring. Okay, so you're gonna be breaking up that chicken as it cooks in the water. Often when I'm doing the pork version of this, I don't bother with the water because there seems to be so much fat and juice in the pork that it kind of cooks itself. Um, so I just put it into a dry frying pan. But with the chicken, I think it's particularly important because otherwise it just browns too much. So that doesn't take very long at all. And now what I wanna do is kind of scoop the chicken into a bowl. I don't want too much of that liquid though. So I'm just gonna leave that behind in the pan. Now, while the chicken is really hot and steamy, I like to add in the red shallots and then also a little bit of dressing. And I just give that a bit of a mix first because I find that heat kind of softens the harsh onion flavor. Okay, now time for all those beautiful herbs and my mint and then more of that dressing. And now give that a really good mix. And then we're gonna do some final seasoning. Those fresh herbs, oh, on the dressing and the chili and everything. It's just like this massive explosion. Great. I'm gonna add a little bit more dressing and then a little bit more of this roasted rice powder for me, I think. Now the rice powder does two things. It adds a really beautiful, almost nutty kind of flavor. And it also makes sure that the dressing and everything kind of thickens up a little bit and really coats all of those bits of chicken. And for me, it's just not quite spicy enough. This is supposed to be a really super hot, hot, spicy dish. Obviously, if you wanna keep it mild, leave the chili out, but I'm gonna add more. <laughs> Mm. Okay, now we're really good. Mm. So good. Now to serve it all up, we're gonna do it the traditional way so you guys can see how we would eat it here in Bangkok. Uh, so what we like to do is have a little bit of cabbage on the side. And then these guys here are called snake beans and you can see they've got kind of like a rough edge here. Uh, you could just use green beans as well. And some cucumber. My salad out on the plate. 
little bit of extra mint. And then the whole idea here is that the chicken is really super hot. And then all these bits and pieces like the cabbage and the beans and the cucumber, that'll cool down your palate in between mouthfuls of the chicken. Thailand's famous Penang curry. If you've always wanted to make this at home, then I have the perfect recipe for you. Okay, so for this one, we're gonna make our curry paste from scratch. And I love making Thai curry paste. I think it's one of the best ways to get to know a lot of different Thai ingredients and also to figure out what Thai ingredients your Asian grocer has down the road. <laughs> um, so let's start off with the chilies first. Now for most Thai red chili paste, we use the dried red chilies for this rather than the fresh. So I've had these soaking in some hot water for about 10 minutes or so. Just wanna cut them up. Now we're gonna be using a blender today uh, and I've got lots of little tips and tricks here for how we can best use the blender to make a curry paste at home because there's a few little things that might catch you up First tip is to chop things up quite small because that's gonna help your blade get everything really smooth. And then the second thing, so this chili water, just keep that for when we go to blend because we may need to moisten the mixture to help it get really smooth. You'll see what I mean a little bit later. Now the next ingredient is galangal. So galangal looks like this, similar to ginger but not. <laughs> it has a very beautiful pine forest, citrusy, high note to its aromas and flavors. It's really worth seeking out and it freezes quite well as well. You'll see that there's little bits of pink on here as well. That's another way to tell that that's your galangal and not ginger. Now what you need to do is just peel the galangal, just a small piece, and then finely chop. Next we want some garlic. And then some red Asian shallots as well. Now you can use French shallots here too. And now some lemongrass. Mm, I love that smell so much. Now what we need to do here is bruise the lemongrass. Just cut that end off because it's often very tough. And then peel off these outer layers because they're also really tough and fibrous. And now finely slice. And I also want some coriander roots. So just take those off. Now, if you're using coriander at home and you're not using the roots, just stick them in the freezer until you're ready to make your curry paste. That way you're not wasting any. And now for the kaffir lime element. So this should be one of the crucial flavors for a true Thai Penang curry. And what I like to do is use both the leaves and then also the fruit itself, which is this gnarly looking guy right here. <laughs> so with the leaves, you wanna take those off the stem and then pull the stem out of the leaf as well. Roll those up and then finally slice. And then the lime itself. So the lime juice inside of here is really bitter. And I've asked and asked and asked my mom about what you can use it for in terms of food. Now she said that in her village they don't use it for food, they just use it to put in their hair, funnily enough. But um, anyway, I have not tried it in my hair, but you guys feel free. What we need here is the actual lime peel. So you wanna get as much of the peel as possible without too much of that white stuff underneath, because that will be bitter. A little bit's okay. Just need two or three slices here. Now I just want a really fine chop on this. Now I know this ingredient's gonna be a bit hard for a lot of you to find, don't worry. If you can't find the kaffir lime itself, then just use the leaves and just leave that out. But if you can get a hold of these, it really makes a big difference to the paste. And then shrimp paste, yes, it's kind of funky smelling, but it adds a beautiful saltiness and background umami flavor to the dish. You don't even know it's there at the end. So just pop it in the paste and don't worry about it. And now for my dried spices, a little bit of coriander and some cumin. And then the last ingredient you'll find in some recipes and not others, I've done my paste with and without, but there's some peanuts here, but if you have allergies, you can totally leave these out. Won't make a huge difference. Now let's start blending. Now if we have a look here, this is one of the pitfalls of using a blender instead of a mortar and pestle to make your curry paste. So have a look and you can see that what we're getting here is just a lot of chopped ingredients. We're not getting a paste, we're not releasing or smooshing out all those beautiful essential oils and flavours and aromas from the ingredients like you would do 
in a mortar and pestle. So my tip is to add a little bit of liquid to this. Now, a lot of people add oil, that doesn't work out quite so well because for me, that then becomes like an emulsification. The oil thickens up, the ingredients thicken up and everything just becomes the wrong texture. So what you want is some of this chili soaking liquid. A couple of tablespoons first. And because this is just water, when we go to cook it out, it will eventually evaporate and cook out of the paste. So don't worry too much about how much you add. And that's better, but I can still see we're just getting a chop here. So I'm gonna add a little bit more. And that's better. So what I can see here is that that blade is actually catching those ingredients and they seem to be turning over quicker and faster. Exactly what you wanna look out for. Okay, so this is the texture that you're looking for. And this makes enough for two amounts of Penang curry, which is good because you don't want to do all that chopping just for one dinner. Share it out over two. And you can just store the unused curry paste in the freezer. Now comes the easiest part and that's the cooking. So I just need a little bit of oil and half of that curry paste. And I want this curry paste to sizzle and cook out a little bit in the oil because the heat is going to be releasing even more of the flavor and the aroma and then cooking out those raw aromatics like the garlic and the shallots. All of this contributes to flavor. That's what it's all about. Okay, so that's had a minute or so. It smells amazing. Now I'm going to add in my chicken and this is chicken thigh. You could use breast as well, but I'm going to do this the slow way. And the darker meat suits this style of pang a little bit better. And now we add the coconut milk. And as I mentioned, there's a couple of different ways to do Penang. One is really quickly, almost like more like a stir fry style. And for that one, you can use chicken breast or prawns or seafood even. But I'm gonna go with the more traditional, slower cooked method here. And this one's really great for tougher cuts of beef or the chicken thigh. And then pop a lid on, turn the heat down and let that simmer away for half an hour. You're not supposed to be checking. Don't open the lid. Yeah, checking. Listen to your mom. Why is your mom being a Okay, so this is smelling so amazing. Let's have a look. Ah, and that's just what we want. So this longer cooked Penang style of curry has that really nice thick sauce and some of that red oil on the top. Mm. Just perfect. Okay, now for the seasoning, because of course we haven't seasoned this yet with the fish sauce and palm sugar. I like to do it at the end. I always like to taste first, just get an idea of how things are going. Now for the palm sugar, you'll see that it usually comes in these hard blocks. So you just need to shave that sugar so it dissolves quickly into the curry. And then the fish sauce as well. Let's see how we're going. Mm, almost there. To me, this style of curry should have a little bit more sweetness than usual. So I'm gonna put a little bit more palm sugar in. Mm. And now we're floating in that territory of the amazing. You know, the thing that I love about Thai curries is you bring all these huge flavors like fish sauce and galangal and kaffir lime leaves and palm sugar and chilies and you create something so harmonious and so beautiful at the end. Mm, that is just delicious. Now to serve this up, dish out the curry first. Ah, look at how thick and luscious that is. And then a little drizzle of extra coconut cream on the top. And as I said at the beginning, the kaffir lime leaf flavor is really important here. So I want some extra finely sliced leaves on the top and just a couple of slices of chili. And there you go, guys, a classic Thai Penang chicken curry. Oh, one of my favorites. I hope you love it too.